Listen up, I am your instructor. My name is Chad. Today we are going to be taking the 101 course, the basic course on beer safety. Today's block of instruction is going to cover the four cardinal rules of beer safety. If you follow these four rules in conjunction with one another, you will not have accidents. You will not have issues where you were wasting alcohol, also known as alcohol abuse. Are there any questions? Okay, let's go. The first rule of beer safety is to always ensure you are practicing glass awareness. Always understand where you are pointing this glass and do not point it at anyone you do not intend to serve a beer to. Otherwise, accidents may happen. Even if this glass is empty, it should not be pointed at anyone you do not intend to serve a beer to. The second cardinal rule of beer safety is to always, always, always keep your pouring finger off of the tap until you are ready to pour the beer. Way too often an accident will happen because someone has their finger on the tap and they don't realize that their beer is already full. Too many accidents happen, much beer is wasted this way. The third cardinal rule of beer safety is to always know what is your beer and what is beyond your beer. That is to think two beers ahead at all times. This will prevent you from unintentionally murdering an additional beer when you only needed to murder a single beer. The fourth and final rule of beer safety is to always treat this beer as if it is full. Whether your beer is in a can, a bottle, or a glass, you must always verify that your beer is empty before assuming that it is empty. And in order to be completely sure that it is empty, you must visually and physically confirm that it is indeed an empty glass. There is only one authorized procedure for verifying that your beer is indeed empty visually and physically, and that is known as the MBC, or Mandatory Beer Chug, which I will demonstrate at this point in time. At this point in time, I will charge my beer. Observe, you can see that the beer is full. The procedure of an MBC is as follows. And now you can see that this beer is visually and physically empty. Thank you for your time and your attention during this course. It has now provided you with the tools that you need to be safe with beer. Until the next one, chat out. What's going on everybody? Welcome back to another video. Today I'm going to be tackling the Belgian Blonde and this is a beer that I'm very excited for. This is going to be the inaugural video on our Belgian beers series uh, that I'm, I've just been dying to work on this ever since I got back from Belgium. Uh, but there's a couple things that have kind of had to happen first. Obviously I had to work on that basement brewery build and get that up and running. And secondly, I've also had to move a lot of stuff in. There's been a lot of things going on in life right now. It's kind of prevented me from getting started as quickly as I wanted to. That being said, no worries, here we are today actually working on this thing. This is a really fun beer style that I've been looking forward to making and I kind of want to say something before we even get started and that is I think the Belgian Blonde is an underbrewed and underappreciated beer style. It's always overshadowed by triples and dark strong ales and anything from Belgium that's over 9% alcohol because that's what they're known for, right? But also, I think there's a lot of people that just incorrectly compare Belgian Blonde to American Blonde Ale. Uh, American Blonde Ale is like somewhere a notch below American Pale Ale in terms of hop character. Uh, it's just restrained malts, restrained hops, and just a gentle drinking experience, which is great sometimes, but it's absolutely nowhere near what a Belgian Blonde is. Belgian Blondes are full of flavor. They don't necessarily have the alcohol punch that you get out of like the big Trappist styles, but they are absolutely delicious beers. One of the best beers I had in the entire trip was the West Vlederen 6 or the West Vlederen Blonde, uh, which had some of the cleanest, crispest, most, I, for lack of a better word, beautiful malt flavor. I was absolutely blown away by how good that beer was. Ever since having it, I've been like, okay, I need to make this thing for myself. So today's beer is gonna be sort of based off of that. I cannot outright call it a clone because I don't have access to their brewing methods or styles, but I know a few things. And if you watch that trip video, you'll know that there's a certain way that these beers are made that varies significantly from brewery to brewery. Uh, so I'm gonna try and take what I know about West Flatterin's brewing styles and apply it here today. This is not the first beer in the series though um, that I've actually brewed. I've already gone ahead and completely finished brewing and fermenting the Belgian quadruple or the dark strong ale simply because that's the biggest, strongest, and darkest beer of them all in this series and I want to make sure it's ready by the time we're actually ready to taste it. So it's got to sit in age for a while. <laughs> Um, it's in a keg right now, came out to about 10.5% ABV, so pretty much nailed everything on that one. 
but I'm super excited to do the Belgian Blonde. I'm not in front of a green screen right now because I'm wearing a green shirt and I think that's probably gonna look a little funny, um, but this is, yep, this is the background of the new place. If you like the shirt, by the way, new shirts available down in the merch store, check it out. Before we get started though, just a big thank you to a couple specific organizations for helping make the video possible. First of all, Northern Brewer, they provided me all of the ingredients I needed to make this batch of beer. In case you're not aware already, Northern Brewer is no longer owned by AB InBev, so woo, check them out for all the ingredients that you need for your batches of beer. Secondly, Clawhammer Supply. They make the system that I've been brewing on for the last year and a half. It's a fantastic system for five gallon batches. You have 120 volt and 200 40 volt options. Check them out using the link below uh, to see if that sort of thing is right for you. And thirdly, Grillaholics. Big thank you to them for helping support this channel as well. They are a manufacturer of high quality grilling and smoking accessories. I'm actually really into barbecue and grilling. I just don't happen to have it on the channel or feature it all that much, but uh, they've been a huge help for that side of things and they have some pretty great stuff. So feel free to check them out in the link below uh, if you wanna see more. All right, so now let's jump into our recipe. So we're actually gonna be splitting the base malt in this one. Uh, usually I just use Belgian Pilsner malt uh, for pretty much all the base malt in a Belgian beer, but this one I decided I kind of want to try it out. I'm going to split this mostly between Dingemann's Pilsner Malt and Dingemann's Pale Malt, uh, just to get a little extra complexity in there. Hopefully that comes through. So I'm using six pounds of Dingemann's Pilsner Malt and four pounds of Dingemann's Pale Malt. And then on top of that, we're going to add half a pound of Dingemann's Aromatic Malt. Aromatic Malt is a traditional uh, kind of toasted malt, basically, from the Belgian region. It's pretty common in Belgian beers, and it helps accentuate that maltiness and that just kind of nice richness that you get out of the malt flavors in their beers. So that's gonna go in. And then on top of that, we're gonna add one pound of Simplicity Candy Syrup. This is basically a colorless candy syrup. Candy sugar is a traditional ingredient in Belgian brewing. Most of their beers have some form of simple sugars in them in the form of candy sugar or candy syrup. You can absolutely sub in any other kind of white simple sugar, probably pound for pound. Um, but candy syrup is just the easiest way to do it. It's very quick to dissolve into the wort. It doesn't scorch on any elements because it dissolves instantaneously, basically. Um, and it's also a very simple sugar broken down to its lowest levels already, so you don't need to worry too much about whether your sugar gets broken down all the way or not. But this ingredient is gonna help do two things. First of all, it's gonna increase the alcohol percentage of the beer without increasing the body, uh, but it's also going to significantly dry the beer out a little bit. So our final gravity is probably gonna be lower than anticipated, increasing our overall alcohol percentage, but it gives you that ability to have that nice, light, easy drinking beer with a dangerous level of alcohol behind it. For hops, we're gonna bitter this with half an ounce of Magnum at 60 minutes, and then we're gonna wait all the way until about five minutes from the end, we're gonna to toss in two ounces of Saz. Saz is not a Belgian hop, it's a Czech hop, but I wanna try it out in this uh, particular style. I love the flavor of Saz, um, and I think it would actually work really, really well kind of coming across in that spicy herbal way that would really complement a Belgian blonde. So adding it in at five minutes is gonna give us a good balance of flavor and aroma. So the water profile on this beer is going to be um, basically the same water profile I think I'm gonna use for all of my Belgian beers. It's a relatively neutral water profile actually um, with no significant chloride to sulfate ratio. It's just relatively balanced, um, but there's a little amount of, of calcium in there and a little amount of bicarbonate in there. What I'm getting at is I don't think the brewing water in Belgium is really all that minerally. Some places have a high bicarbonate level, I know that, um, but in most cases it's really not needed, uh, I think, to get that character. And if you add too many minerals to the brewing water, it starts to really kind of come across in the flavor. I want it to just be a very nice background addition. So basically we are using more or less fortified spring water. I'm starting with eight gallons of spring water, yes, because spring water has a little bit of extra residual minerals in it um, that is, essentially just gonna be there to kind of provide a little bit of background. You can go ahead and use distilled and RO water as well if you want to, it's not gonna be a big deal, but spring water is just a little bit easier. In my case, it comes in these big five gallon jugs, so it's a little less waste for me. Anyway, our water profile is 60 parts per million of calcium, six parts per million of magnesium, 18 parts per million of sodium, 79 parts per million of chloride, 62 parts per million of sulfate, and 47 parts per million of bicarbonate. And in order to get that water profile, I'm adding uh, two grams of gypsum, two grams of Epsom, five grams of calcium chloride, and two grams of baking soda all to the strike water. Uh, and that again is eight gallons of spring water. 
So our mash schedule on this beer is gonna be different. I'm gonna be step mashing all of the Belgian beers pretty much. It's really a good way to get higher efficiency out of your beer. It's a good way to retain good head retention, good protein structure without making the body of the beer overly full. We want this to be a very highly drinkable beer. You can't have these beers be strong in alcohol and full bodied. It just doesn't work like that. So there's really two options here. You can either do a very long mash rest at a very low temperature like 148 or 149 degrees or you can do a step mash and I think the step mash is really going to be the better way to do it here so I'm doing a relatively simple two to three step mash here basically uh, the first step is going to be 45 minutes at 148 degrees for a beta rest and that's going to get us 90% of our fermentable sugars and then we're going to step it up to 158 degrees for 30 minutes and that is gonna be the alpha rest. While we step up to that higher temperature, we're denaturing most of the beta amylase and allowing the alpha amylase enzyme to do its work uninhibited. That's randomly chopping up longer chain sugars so that we get these different amounts of residual sugars that some of which are fermentable by the yeast and some of which are not. That gives us a little bit of more complexity in the end product. And then lastly, we're gonna move to a mash out at 170 degrees Fahrenheit for about 15 minutes. That's gonna help aid in laudering and help drain the brain basket a bit easier um, and also dramatically helps in work clarity. For the yeast on this beer, we are using none other than the West Mall West Bladder and Strain that is Imperial Triple Double. So without further ado, let's go ahead and jump into the brew day. I added eight gallons of spring water to my claw hammer supply 120 volt system and started to heat it up to the mash temperature. While it was heating up, I measured out all of my water salts and I added those to the strike water and I milled my grain. Once the water had reached the mash in temperature, I mashed in with a grain bill, being sure to break up any clumps in the mash. Next, I started recirculating. I let the mash sit at 148 Fahrenheit for its first step for 45 minutes. By 10 minutes in, I took a pH measurement and I saw a higher than planned pH of 5.57. So I added a few milliliters of lactic acid and that brought it back down. Once the mash had sat for 35 more minutes, I raised it up to the next mash step of 158 Fahrenheit. I let that sit there for 30 minutes. 30 minutes later, I raised it to the final step of 170 Fahrenheit and I let it rest there for 15 minutes. Then at that point I pulled out the grain basket and let it drain for 15 more minutes. I fired up the controller to 100% power at this time. Using my Anton Parr Easy Dense, I saw a pre-boil gravity of 1047, which is two points higher than my target. Once I reached the boil, I added my 60 minute bittering addition, which was half an ounce of Magnum. Once 50 minutes had elapsed, I added some yeast nutrient and a Whirlflock tablet, and then I started adding in the one pound of Simplicity candy syrup, just being sure to fully stir and incorporate it in until it was fully dissolved. Ten minutes later, I added my zero minute hop addition, which was two ounces of saws. I then killed the boil by starting to recirculate boiling wort through the chiller and the pump, which is in my opinion just the easiest and the best way to ensure sanitation of your chilling equipment. After being sure the inside of the chiller and the pump are all sterilized, then I began to chill down to 65 Fahrenheit. I took an OG sample using the Easy Dents before it cooled down, and I saw an original gravity of 1057, which was my exact target OG, which is a good feeling to always nail that. I aerated by splashing into my anvil bucket fermenter, and then I pitched my yeast and I left it to ferment. So 
So now let's talk about the fermentation on this beer. There's a lot of different ways to make it happen. So Belgian beers are really made in the fermentation and it's worth spending some time talking about this. There are a number of different Belgian yeast strains available to produce different effects in the final beer. I'm trying to replicate the West Vlederen Blonde Ale, so I'm probably going to try and use the same yeast that West Vlederen uses, right? Well, they use the West Mall strain, which is Weiss 3787, WLP 530, or Imperial Triple Double. Also of critical importance here is that you pitch enough yeast and you pitch the right amount of yeast. So for all of these Belgian fermentations, especially considering what I plan on doing with them, I'm going to be giving you an actual pitch rate and I'm gonna tell you how I made that starter so that you guys can do the same thing for yourselves. In this case, I'm gonna be pitching about 0.75 million cells uh, per milliliter per degree Play-Doh. And what that means is I made a two liter starter uh, with a 1040 gravity starter wort, and I pitched one packet of Imperial Triple Double into it and let it go from there on out. Your pitch rate is probably the biggest factor in terms of how clean that beer ferments and how uh, Belgian-y basically it is at the end of the fermentation. Um, there's a number of factors, a number of levers that you could pull to kind of tweak the final output, and that's pitch rate, aeration level, fermentation temperature, really. Um, but without getting too complicated, uh, I think pitch rate's probably the easiest one to modify. You almost always want to make sure that you're taking good care of your yeast and you're pitching enough of it because um, it will take care of you at that point. What I intend on doing with this yeast is starting it out at 65 degrees Fahrenheit and then just letting it free rise to as high as it wants to go up to about 82 degrees Fahrenheit. Yes, 82. Very hot temperature, right? This is actually the highest temperature that West Vlederen also ferments their beer at. And they also open ferment, by the way, which I'm not doing in this case because I'm in the basement. It's a little risky for me, but I am gonna follow their temperature fermentation regimen. So basically I'm gonna let the yeast free rise as hot as it wants to get. But if it tries to go past 82, I'm gonna cap it down there at 82. This yeast will continue to get hotter and hotter as it ferments. However, if you start to cool it down rapidly or you panic cool it and you bring it all the way down like five or six degrees, it could totally stall out on you. It can completely quit fermentation halfway through a beer uh, and just not get started again. It's very finicky. So um, just keep that in mind. Let it do what it wants to do really. And then as it finishes fermentation, as it starts to naturally cool off after reaching the peak of fermentation, then you can maybe start to gradually bring it down to a lower temperature. With this beer, it's not super high ABV. I don't really need to get condition it for too long, so I'm expecting that the fermentation will probably be done in about a week, and after that I could probably transfer into a keg and let it condition at room temperature for a little bit longer if it needs to, but it very well may not need to. I very well may be able to actually put this on tap and get it ready to go quickly. Of course, you can also bottle condition this if you want to, but when I was in Belgium, Pretty much every single Abbey beer was available on tap if you looked hard enough. And there was nothing I could tell that was different about it from a bottle conditioned one. So I'm just gonna go ahead and put this one on tap. It's a little bit easier for me and it's gonna get me 99.9% .9 of the character. And yes, you can argue with me over smaller bubbles and different carbonation levels and stuff like that. That's fine. Now you can also ferment this with a couple different Abbey strains if you want to. You can also ferment it with a gold nail strain as well, like the Ardenne strain, the 1388 Duvel strain is good as well. It's gonna give you a different character. Those are a little bit spicy a little bit more phenolic. The Abbey Ales are a little bit more estuary, a little bit fruitier. Um, so just keep that in mind. But whatever, whatever strain you choose to use, make sure you're following the right fermentation temperature regimen for it. And make sure you let it ferment all the way out. These yeasts are very strong attenuators. I already got an attenuation of 80% on my quad. So just keep that in mind. If you're looking at 75% attenuation, you might want to let it continue to go down a little bit further as, again, the sugar is going to dry this out a lot as well. Whatever you do, don't ferment this one under pressure. You're going to probably stall the yeast out. You're going to basically make a beer with Without any yeast esters. I also usually talk about using Kvike as an alternative fermentation method for a lot of people. In most beers, this is again not a situation where that happens. These beers are 90% fermentation, basically. That character you cannot achieve without a Belgian yeast. Again, don't try using Kvike for it. It's just not right for the style. It's gonna give you a totally different beer. I'm sure it'll be fine, but it's a totally different beer. So in a nutshell, this is what I'm doing. I'm pitching about 300 to 350 billion yeast cells into the wort. That's a two liter starter uh, made from one packet of Imperial yeast. I'm gonna pitch that yeast at 65 degrees, and then I'm gonna let the yeast free rise all the way up to 82 degrees, but not higher. I'm gonna let it 
finish its fermentation at its own pace, which will probably be pretty quick, about five to seven days, at which point I'll start tasting it, I'll start deciding if it needs to sit and condition a bit longer or if it's good to go, which it very well may be. So at that point, once it's ready, I will keg it and I'll put it on tap and we should be ready to talk about it. So I'll catch you guys then. So this beer fermented very quickly. Um, it only took about a week to reach our final gravity of 10.08, uh, which gave us a, a solid attenuation of 85% uh, all the way down from 10.57. So we had a nice round 6.5% ABV. The beer was tasting a little bit banana heavy, so I put it in the keg, let it condition a little bit longer, just so we can get some of the edges off of it. So the beer is called Flemish Gold. It comes in at 6.5% ABV and 31 IBUs. Okay, so for appearance of the beer, it's a beautiful medium gold uh, color. It's, it's definitely hazy. Um, it's a little bit more hazy, I think, than I was going for. At the end of the day, some of the best Trappist monasteries in the entire world make their beers hazy. So um, I don't know what the BJCP is going on about having a crystal clear style here. The head retention on it is absolutely amazing. I'm actually really proud of that. So it came out with a really, really nice, fluffy, uh, well-structured head, very small bubbles, very good lacing as well. But also the head retention is excellent. So this beer has been sitting out here as I've been setting up my camera and stuff, and there's still a solid layer on the surface, like a thicker layer than usual. I like the color quite a bit. Uh, I think some of the aromatic malt in there did certainly turn it a bit darker than your typical blonde, but in the sunlight, it's actually quite a nice color. Nice, nice light orange gold. So now we'll go in for aroma. So the aroma on this beer is, it's rather subtle. Um, it's not as strong as some of the other Belgians that I've made. But it's mostly just like a little bit of clove, coriander, a little bit of banana. It also has a little bit of a fresh citrus note to it, kind of like an orange blossom. Very gentle aroma, nothing crazy going on here, but uh, it is pleasant. It smells very fresh too. It kind of smells like a wit beer, to be honest. So now let's go in for mouthfeel. It's got a very similar mouthfeel to a lighter bodied Hefeweizen. and it has this puffiness to it that you might expect from wheat malt. But like I said, I didn't use a single grain of wheat malt in this entire brew. But it's also got a very nice high carbonation level to style. Um, I did my best to, uh, to bring this up to about three volumes of CO2, um, which does result in a little extra foam off the tap. But if you pour it in a nice big goblet like this, it doesn't really matter uh, all that much. So overall, the mouthfeel is a little bit of a fuller mouthfeel though than I think I'm targeting here. Typically with a Belgian beer like this, you want it to be a very light bodied mouthfeel. Um, this is like a medium light. So while it's definitely enjoyable and as a blonde, it's kind of got a little bit of wiggle room there. It's not as light as I would have wanted it to otherwise be, but at the end of the day, not a huge problem for the beer. So now let's go ahead and talk about flavor. Hmm. I'm actually really enjoying this beer. Um, <laughs> the flavor on this one is, it's different. Um, it's kind of lending itself towards the Whitbeer territory. It's, it's a little bit more orange and coriander kind of, again, neither of which I actually used in this beer. Um, that's all from yeast, hops, and malt. There's a mild bitterness on this one. Up front, I'm getting mostly like a semi-sweet honey malt, definitely some orange, lots of floral notes in this. Um, and then again, that similar like clove kind of banana character you would get out of a Hefeweizen. Not as strong in this case, um, but it's definitely there. It's very gentle, easy drinking. Even though this beer actually clocks in at six and a half percent ABV, it really doesn't feel like it. It comes in more like a five percent, five and a half maybe. Uh, very sessionable, very easy to drink. Um, but if you're not careful, that six and a half will catch up to you. Overall though, it's a very gentle flavor. Uh, it's, it's really not all that overwhelming. It's not all that powerful. Even though I use the Abbey yeast in this one, it doesn't really have all of the full aromatics and 
fruitiness of the Abbey yeast. There's definitely some banana in there, but it's really not all that strong. I think the reason for that is because I fermented this one a little bit on the lower end. It didn't want to get as hot as some of the other beers that I've made with the Abbey yeasts. It only got up to about 75 degrees. Um, and then it just rapidly went down from there. The fermentation was very fast. I think the beer didn't really get hot enough to produce a ton of esters here. Overall, I definitely like the beer. It's, it's really good for this time of year, very refreshing. It makes a pretty solid Belgian blonde, to be honest. But there are a couple things that I would do to make it a little bit different, make it a little bit nicer, um, and a little bit more towards what I was targeting. This is definitely no West Flutter and Six, not at all. Um, it's actually a little bit closer to a Chimay Doré, uh, ironically. But there's a few things I would do differently. The first is I think I encountered an issue with my mash pH. So initially it was a little bit higher than I wanted. It was like 5.6. And I did correct for that with lactic acid, but like a intelligent person, I decided not to actually confirm my new mash pH. And I just assumed that it was fine. And I think it actually dropped it lower than I wanted to. I think it ended up around like 5.1. Probably, if I had to guess. That's affecting the complexity of this beer a little bit. It is not as bright as I want it to be. And I think that's due to mash pH. Um, so the malt flavor is not as crisp as I want it to be. The second thing is, Saws is a great hop. One of my favorites, actually. It's a really nice earthy flavor that's sort of in here. But the thing is, it's most used with Czech lagers or otherwise just clean fermenting lagers, where there's no yeast flavor for that hop flavor to hide behind. It's a very delicate, gentle flavor. And I think it got blown out by the Belgian yeast character in this beer. So I'm definitely getting some earthiness, a little bit of herbal spice, but nothing like you would expect out of like a Czech Pilsner uh, where that sauce is on full display. But like I said, I think it's getting blown out by the yeast. I think a substitution uh, of a couple different hops in here would make a big difference. The first would be Hallertau at probably 10 minutes, um, and then maybe some Styrian Goldings, either at 10 minutes or zero minutes, uh, instead of Saz. Those two hops together are very floral and spicy. So Hallertown gives this wonderful orange blossom chamomile character to me. Um, I used that in my triple and it was amazing. Uh, and then also Styrian Goldings on top of that gives you that quintessential Belgian coriander spice that you get from hops. Um, it's really an interesting one. I honestly should have used that or both of them uh, in this beer and I think it would have taken it to a whole new level. Uh, but otherwise, everything else worked out really well. The step mash did exactly what I wanted it to do. The water profile is doing exactly what I want it to do. Not too minerally, it's not too biased towards sulfates or chlorides, so it's not too malty, it's not too dry. Um, and the yeast is doing exactly what I want it to do as well. So overall, it's pretty good. Just a couple things had fixed. Uh, at the end of the day, I'm very happy with this beer. It's a good blonde and I'm really enjoying it. I bottled off a bunch and the remainder's in the keg. Overall, wood brew again, just with those changes. So thanks for watching, guys. I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope you learned something. I hope it was useful to you. And if it was, I would please ask to hit that like button. Please comment down below, subscribe if you haven't already and share if you can or if you want to. It really helps me quite a bit and it doesn't cost you anything. But there's a few other ways to support the channel. Uh, first of all, you can check out my t-shirt store, which is available down below the description box. You'll see this t-shirt there along with plenty of other ones. Check them out if you're interested. I get about 30% of the sticker price off of those, uh, but it does really help support me in a great way. Secondly, I also have a Patreon. So my Patreon subscribers are really helping out with the production behind this channel. You guys are enabling me to pay for a really nice video editing software that's a huge step up from my last one. That's what I've been using for this video and a few before it. So big thank you to you guys for actually helping directly impact the channel like that. I also have channel memberships now, which is just a few bucks a month. You get a couple perks um, and it helps you stand out a little bit from everyone else in the comments section. So if you're curious about that, please hit that join button that's next to the subscribe button to see more. I also have an Amazon store, which is available again in the description box, where I have a whole list of all of my equipment that is available on Amazon that I use on the regular and I thoroughly recommend. So check that out if you are in the market for some equipment. If you want to follow me in more than just YouTube, I'm also active on Instagram as The Apartment Brewer. So check it out for more frequent content updates so you can see what's coming to the channel next. And if you are still here, thank you very much for watching all the way to the end. It does mean a lot to me and it helps out so much. So thank you very much for being here. And until the next one, cheers. Oh, that's really high carbonation. Oh.